This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris. We've got two guests today. David Granzella, founder of NorCal RIA. Uh, NorCal RIA is Sacramento's premier real estate investment club. NorCal RIA provides quality real estate investment education and resources for their members, guests, and friends. The emphasis and commitment to solid real estate investor education enables their members to make calculated investment decisions for continued wealth acquisition and wealth retention in this rapidly changing market environment. Since 2004, associates and relations, uh, relationships with some of the most successful investors and educators in the business have allowed NorCalRIA to provide its members with the most current and essential real estate investment techniques, strategies, and investment analysis. David, we welcome you. And now also uh, with us today is Laurel Sagan, president of Laurel Buys Houses. Laurel is a real estate professional in the Sacramento area where she runs a real estate investment and development company called Laurel Buys Houses. Her primary goal is to do everything she can to help homeowners work through their difficult situations and find options that meet their needs. For the past 20 years, she has helped thousands of families feel in control again, enhancing and transforming distressed properties to the highest standards. Laurel is known for building beautiful homes and strong business relationships some of her renovated homes have been featured on HDTV, multiple media outlets, and home tours. Laurel uh, values empathy, honesty, and results uh, as guiding principles for her company's con how her company conducts business. We welcome you both to the Norris Group Radio Show. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate it. Um, interesting. Laurel, I'm going to start with you. When you mentioned 20 years ago, um, is that, is that approximately ac really accurate? So you, you got into it around 2000? Yeah, uh, 1999, 2000. I, um, I was making insane money in the tech world. Uh, more, I'd always been in nonprofits before that or in the construction field uh, as a laborer. And so I started making big money, decided to buy rentals in Sacramento and renovate them myself. Okay. And um, by 2002, that's all I was doing full time. Wow. Okay. But you were, you kind of did a lot of holding. I did. I had 30 doors at one time with my, uh, with partners and I, and then we got completely creamed in the downturn. Oh, <laughs> I, <laughs> completely I want completely killed. Learn a lot about <laughs> banks and people not paying their rent. I burned through my entire 401k to try to stay afloat. I had stopped buying back in 2004, 2005, because it wasn't making any sense. Right. And I knew it would come down, but I did. Some of my houses went down over 70%. I, and people yeah. stopped paying the rent. I couldn't. And I had gotten a little aggressive just before I stopped buying. So I okay. got killed. Well, I know, learned a lot. <laughs> it, it's always interesting to me where, when people start, because, you know, I know those charts pretty well. So, you know, you had a really good run of price. And when you first get into something, you think, okay, this is how it is. Oh, my God. I am brilliant. <laughs> I refinanced my first two houses like five times. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was brilliant. And I had got those really great loans, right? So my payments were really low. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, welcome to the fray because that's, uh, we all go through that where you go get that aha moment where you go, uh Oh, <laughs> this goes in the other direction. Uh, fortunately I, I learned that lesson in 1990 to 92. So by 2005, yeah, I was on the sidelines going, I'll see you guys later. Um, David, and I didn't did know about you. Obviously I learned about you after that. Okay. <laughs> and David, <laughs> David's club after that, but yeah. I thought it was brilliant at the time. I just thought it was really brilliant. <laughs> now, why did you do so well in the tech world? What was that about? Um, well, um, I don't know. People say I have a gift for gab. I was a technical recruiter. Um, my wife, at, well, we weren't married at the time, but she was my boss. And she recruited me in from the nonprofit world to do this. And I was magic. I had Barclays Global, um, 
some Microsoft companies, Web TV, and um, other really big, nice tech companies. I was in the Bay Area, and I was making thirty thousand dollars a month placing people. Wow! And had a lot of contractors. And when the guys at Barclays Global couldn't explain that I was sending to New York to do these credit swap default platforms, couldn't explain to me, I have a degree in business, couldn't explain to me how this worked. Mm -hmm. I knew we were in trouble. I just didn't know what to do about it. Okay. Interesting. All right. I found out what they were doing with my mortgages. And I was like, this is not good. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Uh, David? When did you when did you become a real estate investor? First of all, um, I was laid off September fourteenth, two thousand and one, in corporate America, and I knew at the time uh, it was probably the best opportunity I was ever going to have in my life because I was really tired of uh, work, working for somebody else, different corporations, and I got sucked up into the usual job um, perks, pay, company cars, all the perks of life. Um, my son at the time was a single parent with a 14 year old son and there's responsibility and then trying to spend time on weekends with him rather than have a, a second job, trying to create, um, opportunities mm-hmm. in real estate, uh, transitioned. And I decided I, I knew at the time, I remember seeing my boss and I walked in on a Friday afternoon. I saw my boss's office like as usual. And I saw the vice president standing in there. <laughs> that was interesting. I go, Hmm. I remember still looking at the, at the glass window going, huh? And I remember them waving me. It's like, come on, come on over here. It's like, I'm walking that, uh, that walk. And I'm not quite sure it was the walk of joy or the walk of death. But I walked in and they, they looked at me and said something to the effect of, um, well, we're, we're, um, we're laying you off. And they, I, I looked at them and um, I said, wow. I reached out my hand and said, oh, my goodness, thank you. And they, they looked at one another. They know I don't smoke or drink. They looked at me like they're going to drug test me on the spot. They looked at each other like, we knew Granzella wasn't always there, but this is something's <laughs> off here. And, you know, in my heart, I knew that was, I had freedom. I literally did. And wow. Then, um, but that being said, that weekend following the following week when I'm used to going to work and doing all those things, a little bit of fear and anxiety crept in. But I knew in my heart of hearts that it was um, an opportunity for me to follow my dreams. Matter of fact, about six months after that, the vice president I told you about, I saw at a, um, a play, at an event, and I, uh, his name's John M. And I ran into him, you couldn't miss him. He's six foot two, uh, 300 pounds. It's like I ran into him, gave him a big bear hug, and he starts laughing and hugging me. And he just got off the phone with his son in um, Florida, who was in college at the time. And he said to me, you know what? I'll never forget. I've told that story more times than not. And he goes, um, the same thing happened to me six months after that. And they let me go. Wow. And goes, I didn't take it nearly as well as you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, they probably I, didn't. And ever... I told them what I was doing. And I told them, you know what? I, I'm, I'm just scratching at the surface. But you know what? I'm, I'm on the um, fearfully on the best journey of my life, I believe. And it was absolutely true. Wow. That's cool. Now, when did you start the club? Uh, 2004. Um, I, I found you by then. I, I was actually found uh, Mike Cantu, um, uh, let's see, Peter Fortunato, Mike Cantu, um, Jack, Jack Fullerton. I found some of the clubs down there. We didn't have any clubs up here in Northern California. So I would actually fly down there. Oh, and Mike Cantu had those, and Mick Blackwell had those lunches. I think it was on Tuesdays. And I was invited to one of those. So I would fly down and go to lunch and sit there with my notepad um, in the corner. I sit in the corner taking all, all these notes everybody's eating. And I would sit there and just like a sponge and absorb all this. And then I would stick around for the meetings you guys had all your freeways are down there. All your clubs are down there. There's like six different directions in one night. You can go to four different clubs, uh, business club, in real estate right. clubs. And I would go down there and start being enamored by actually some of the education. Some of the, I was baffled by some of the BS, don't get me wrong, but I was also enamored by some of the education, some of the people, um, the quality of people who are actually sharing things rather than hiding things. And um, that's when I got turned on to um, a different format for real estate. And it was sharing, giving away. Then we had all these people coming through town here in Sacramento, starting to um, sell all these courses and all this um, content, quote unquote. And that made me crazy. People selling their life savings, but going yeah. on. Uh, and I just saw that. And I actually, the last straw was I saw a couple, probably back then, um, maybe late seventies. And they were signing up for this crazy course. And you could see the look in their eyes, like this is our last straw, honey. And they didn't have enough money. So they were given this organization was giving them credit cards while they sat there. Wow. And I thought to myself, I could see that this was there. I was trying to talk to them, even though I didn't know that much, but I knew something. And that being said, I saw them 
this was their last hope. And I saw these people taking it from them. And that was kind of the last draw. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I was going to do something. Well, you know what's interesting about both of you? If you've really started at a time where real estate was going to get more volatile than it ever had. You know, we had some, we had some modest downturns, but the, the downturn that you guys survived and continued on is amazing. Uh, you know, if I had gotten wiped out in 2008, nine, uh, it would have been a much different uh, number than it was 90 to 95. Because like you said, stuff went down by 70%. You're just going, well, how do you survive that? I mean, even if you own it free and clear, <laughs> you've got, you've got such damage to your net worth and maybe your tenant's not paying. So that's a scary thing. Um, I'm just curious, Laurel, what is your favorite market to be a buyer in? The, the, the stuff that went on, say, from 2007 to 2012 or a market that happened after that? If I have money? Because <laughs> back then I, I didn't have money or credit, right? I'd been wiped. Um, you know, I don't like holding. I, I have to tell you, I don't like holding. Um, it always made me crazy what tenants would do to my properties. I got emotionally attached to everything I put my blood into. Um, and I, you know, so for me, I like um, not having, you know, being able to do whatever I want and then sell it to somebody else. So I, you know, right after, you know, the 2009 market was a lot of fun for me. I mean, I, I had to move in with my in-laws, so that wasn't fun. But in terms of buying houses, fixing them up, selling them right away, you know, the bank stuff, that was a lot of fun. But I do have to admit the market around 2017 is my favorite because I could buy stuff in the best neighborhoods that was junked up and, you know, take a 1300 square foot house, turn it into a 4,000 square foot house and, you know, buy it for 400 and sell it for 1.3 million and use all my creativity and all my uh, resources to make an insane house. I love that. Wow. Um, well, I love a, that. Well, that's a niche that is not common, right? No, it's really rare. And I, but I really tell you, I have to tell you the truth, doing what I do now, um, which is helping people where their houses are a burden. Right. I have, I have other people decide what to do with the house once I buy it. I'm not even involved in any of the construction really myself. I've got a whole team that does all that. I, um, since I started buying about five years ago directly from people. Mm hmm. I just found kind of like a, it's a calling for me to help people with their house. And, wow. and, and I love that part. But if you're talking about flipping, 2017 was kind of like this insanely fun year in terms of creativity with the houses. Um, and, uh, um, and I think what I love to do, I can do in any market. So I'm not as market driven. I just need to know what the market is doing and how to help people the best in that market, right? What the investors need, what the, what people who are buying houses need and try to figure out how to make that all work. I, you know? I think your confidence that you're there for the right reason has got to come across hundred percent of the time. And when you do that, people tell you stuff. I'm sure you've heard this sentence so many times. I don't know why I'm telling you this. I haven't said this to anybody else. When you hear that, you realize that you're going to not only make a deal, that you've crossed a, the barrier to where you're now really capable of getting the truth so you can actually provide the right answer. Because when they exactly. cover up when they cover up the truth, you're just shooting in the dark. So I used to love that comment. As soon as I heard that comment, I was like, yay. Yeah, you know, and I, I sometimes I know when people aren't going to tell me the truth, I'm like... I, I don't know that I can help, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, if uh, I can't make that connection where they actually tell me what is really going on. And, and a third of the time, I actually hook them up with somebody else to help them because I'm not the best solution for their problem. Absolutely. Wait, and I don't you know, need to be the solution. Maybe one, you know, two out of 10 times, I'm going to make an, a good living. It's... Well, but I, I can I, help them get to where they're going. It's always going to be better for everyone, the whole community. So, 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I'll just take a second. When I started the business, I worked for a company that was ruthless. And I left there in 90 days. I made money because I was a good buyer, but I hated how he treated people. And I thought, oh, my God, I can, is this the only way this business can happen? And so I sort of I wrote my, my ad said, honest investor buys houses for cash. And uh, so that was the first barrier. Are you really honest? Yeah, you know, let's, let's talk. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to bombard your problem with solutions. And that was, it was just a relief to me. I said, well, why don't you list it with a realtor? And then they would fight that. And why don't you do this? I fight that. So when they fought everything I knew how to say do other than that, I realized I'm going to buy this house because that's what you've decided to do. But just telling them the truth, it made me happy when the phone rang. I would not have liked this business if I did it any other way. That was just a big deal to me. Um, David, you, you, got a, you own a club at 2004, and that's a streak that's done exceptionally well for most people. And so it's so easy for investors to, you know, pat themselves on the back and say, that, you know, they've just got it wired. And then, so what was the mood going? Let's say, I, I remember speaking to realtor groups, uh, of course, investment clubs was we went through 2005 and 2006, you know, I got a 400 page report with the word crash on it. No realtor group, no builder group was happy. I showed up to say anything. So what was, what was going on in the group of investors that you had during the end of the, of the boom where everything they touched turned to gold and then it changed really radically quickly? Um, I am a very fortunate person. And for being a Demetallion, um, I was at your event at the end of 2005 and I spent the whole day with that 400 page report at, we're going through it. And so statistically, I'd known you and trusted you by then, but statistically, I'd go with that book and it's like, it's over. I still remember on the plane mumbling to myself by myself. It's over. It's over. <laughs> it's really over. I got to go to Starbucks tomorrow. I got to tell the guys it's over. And um, I, 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 I read what you, I spent the day there. I started going through all the information and I saw it statistically it's done. And it was, there was one of the things I've learned. I learned from uh, 2001 through 2005, almost 2006 actually was um, from, from a lot of it was from you and other people in the business that go by charts, go by statistics, don't go by feelings because, you know, feelings have nothing to do with anything besides um, setting you up for failure. So I statistically figured it out. It's like, what do I do now? And it was easy. I just, um, I wasn't attached to the outcome. I learned a long time ago that um, my success comes when I deliver something to somebody or I, whatever I'm supposed to do when I do it, that's my success. I leave the results out of my control. And I knew, okay, now what are we going to do? We got to change directions. And um, boy, we really had to change directions and quick. And in this business, I did it quickly. And we had, we had some properties down in Phoenix, uh, Mesa, Chandler. We got ourselves out of those. We, we changed our whole business strategy as far as myself, one of my partners, Gordy and myself, um, what we're going to do going in the future. And everybody, it was running up like crazy. And I still remember going back to Arizona about 18 months later and things were changing. And about two years after that, we went back and the people, I remember one gentleman down in, Southern, down in Arizona and he patted me on the shoulder. I'm selling everything. He goes, really, Granzel, you seem like a smart guy, too. So here I am <laughs> three and a half years later. By the way, he might have had a condescending tone to him. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went back 18 months and things were still transitioning. But two years after that, and um, he, he was licking his wounds. I said, hey, he goes, I need to get out of these pro uh, properties. And I gave him an offer for some properties. And he didn't like him. I said, I'm just that's what they're worth to me. And the value, if they work, work for you, you know, contact me. If it's not, you know, I wish you luck. But it was the idea of realizing that I've been around long enough to, for the fact I realized that I just need to do the right thing. Matter of fact, one of the reasons I started the club, we were we would go different places and we were at a, um, a townhouse. They have the little club room and there was probably 35, 40 people there. There was a, chick, a woman named Donna who actually we would switch different places and she was hosting the event that night. And I always sit in the front so I don't get distracted. And she went around the room to introduce herself. And I was a newbie at the business and I had my books. I had my red pen, my black pen, my blue pen. Red was obviously for uh, beware. And uh, I introduced myself and in the next uh, 45 minutes, uh, I was, I would just ask questions. And I, I stuttered at it as a young man. So standing up before people was the last thing I wanted to do. I still remember standing there and I went from shaking a little bit, a little anxiety to actually just talking. 
And it was right around that time that the, I was asked questions. I kept saying, hey, I'm just a newbie here. I'm just, but people would ask me questions. And it was right up before that, we bought a house that have, had um, wood boring beetles. And I had never heard of, heard of a wood boring beetle. And we had a list of what to do. That list we stuck to uh, very religiously about the format. Well, this house had been refinanced about six months before we took it over. So I thought for sure there'd been a pest inspection. So we, we just checked that one off. Well, turns out that house we bought had wood boring beetles and had quite a bit of damage needed to be tented and so forth. And um, uh, we ended up making money on the deal, of course, in terms of the market was going up. We were brilliant. Um, we got to house 10. I think originally it was like a $12,000 bid. I got it down for like $3,400. And I learned from it. And I remember I was going to tell nobody. I was going to take that to my grave. And I realized that, that was my selfishness. That was my ego that was involved versus trying to help somebody. And I remember at the end of that presentation, I said, I'm sitting down and um, thank you for your time. <laughs> I just need to sit down and um, but I, and I told them the story about the wood boring beetles. I said, if, if nothing else, I hope you um, you have a list, you have a checklist and you stick to it. And I hope you go Google wood boring beetles because they're expensive. And I remember I sat down and that was kind of the idea that there's you. And I learned that because I've been down in Southern California where people share things at different clubs. And I realized that was a format that we didn't have here. All right. The, the group of investors as a whole, do you think, most of them got out in time or most of them thought it was going to continue well beyond where, when it did? 50-50. Um, there's some people that I haven't talked to in several years, but up until 15 years afterwards, um, still hadn't, um, were, weren't, were still not made whole. Right. Okay. And, you know, it's just a matter, I, I don't know why, but there's, I think I'd say just for a number 50-50, a lot of people got out and did something with it. And some people just held on to the sinking ship. It's, that, it, it's hard to get out when everything's going well and it's your first experience. I mean, honestly, I, I would have been in one of the group, you know, in 2007 going, what the heck? I, I mean, I thought I was a genius. Well, I, I learned that lesson in, in 91 and 92, and it was a smaller lesson than it would have been in 07 or 08 because of the price damage. And, uh, you know, even as a hard money lender, I was happy that 1991 happened. So we had a lot of, you know, people with money and trustees that we were giving back, you know, we're saying we're not placing this money right now. And, you know, trying to explain to them that that money that's been busy for years isn't going to be busy for a while here. And how we prevented so many foreclosures is, you know, we had a group of people that had paid payments for years on all the loans on time. Then all of a sudden somebody would be 30 days late for the first time. And I would call them and it wasn't an aggressive phone call. It was, do you still have a profit motive on this house? And they said, no. It's that's wow. gone. I said, Hey, let's just auction it off. I'll, I'll eat half of it. And let's go. And th we took 10 grand losses instead of hundred grand losses. Right. And, and we cut to the chase, you know, and uh, we had, we had very few big issues because of that, because we were so aggressive. But I, when I spoke in front of the clubs and front of realtors and front of builders, builders that were the worst, they just, you know, that's a big investment they have and what it, we're in the, they're buying the most land ever in 2005. So, you know, the, the mood of the moment is very dangerous without a chart to look at and go, okay, well, wait a minute, that could be euphoria. Let's don't do that. So, um, you know, Laurel, you, have, you went through that and made a big comeback, which is, that's pretty cool. A lot of hard work and partnerships, you know, some of my partners didn't, didn't play with us and, um, you know, I had a lot of partners then. And, and so some of the partners, I, I worked really hard to make whole just because they were so upset. But the my business partner, Dan McCander and I, we worked hard. Our families, you know, uh, like I said, we moved, I moved in with my in-laws. We, you know, we worked hard to get back and pay everything back we could. Um, and we were flipping houses, you know, we were buying houses for 65,000. Yeah. Putting 15 into them, putting renters and property management and going to the Bay Area and selling them to, to engineers and people who still had jobs uh, for 120. Taking that five, ten thousand dollars profit, make, you know, and we would do that three or four times a month. We kept our crew all the way through that mess. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of hard work and sacrifice, but I knew that, that we would get to this point here 
where where we we're doing. I wish we had the wherewithal or the foresight to figure out how to keep some of those properties for a little while longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now and that's, I'm, you know, I've still got my first two original houses, the house I bought to live in. And then my first rental, I still have them um, because I refinanced them so many times that I don't want to pay the capital gains, but you know what I mean? Um, the loss carry forward was also very, very helpful. <laughs> I would, you know, it was a very long time before I had to pay uh, federal income tax. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's funny. Um, I'm just curious in your in your business model right now. Do you wholesale any, or are you you just strictly a re you retail them? No, I mean uh, I'm really lucky. I have a lot of options for exiting on a property that we tie up, right? So that I can spend all my time figuring out what's going to work for the seller because uh, mm -hmm. I have a lot of things. Some of them uh, we just simply clean up, put back on the MLS and, and hold what we call wholesale hotel. Some I do sell to other investors um, and doing, you know, I'm 62 now. So doing all that physical hard work of managing a lot of, of things, even with project managers, it's a lot of work. So we're doing more and more um, bringing other investors in. And then yes, we do flip. We have, you know, two flipping companies that, um, that we do. Um, but again, I, I feel in my world, I need to have multiple exit strategies to be able to help the, as many people as possible. And then I have my secret, what I think when the market starts to get funny again, what I can do in terms of doing some subject to and other things for long-term holds in a way that I don't have to deal with the tenants, you know? So, okay. but I have multiple strategies and more, you know, this year has been more, uh, bringing other investors in um, than ever before. And it mostly just because, um, you know, when you've done a thousand flips. Not very many people get to say that sentence, by the way. That's <laughs> you've crazy... done the thousand flips. It, you know, you, you get to where you want to bring other younger and I'm spending more time mentoring younger investors, yeah. by the way. I, I was just about to ask that. What is your criteria to have somebody join your team, if you will. In other words, be the recipient. So you get a house. A, a lot of people want to be in that seat where they're the person that's going to receive that deal. But I'm sure you have some criteria that, you know, because you don't want to let anybody down and you don't want to have to deal with some hassle. So how do you decide, okay, you're, yeah, the, no. you're the person? Well, and, you know, and we now, thank God, have the resources to be able to, to, fix almost any problem. Right. Um, but yeah, no, my business partner, Dan, he's the analytical one of us. And he really works with people to make sure they have the resources and the wherewithal to do that. And he makes sure that it's very fair because, you know, when we first started bringing a few friends in to buy these with us, right. You know, we knew them well, but you know, when we're buying as many properties as we are, and you want to bring newer people in. Um, and I have offered to, you know, Bruce, I have flipped over a thousand homes. You would think people would want to know more from me. And I've always said, take, take me to coffee. You know, follow me around. I need a driver <laughs> right now. Why doesn't somebody volunteer to be my, I'm getting older. I can't talk on the phone and drive at the same time, right? <laughs> um, and you would be surprised how few people actually step up and then we put them into our platform and they start getting houses. But you'd be shocked how few people really want to learn. Wow. Okay, that's going to do it for this week's show. Please be sure to tune in next week for part two of our show with NorCal Riaz, David Granzella, and Laurel Sagan from Laurel Buys Houses. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.